First bag had an axe, uh, hacksaw, a scalpel. Uh, second bag had shoes, I believe, and some clothing, lots of clothing. The third bag um, looked like intestine to me. And that's when I called uh, for backup. In the early morning of April 7th, 1996, Officer Freeman spotted a man dumping large black trash bags into the river's edge on Madison Street, New York. As Freeman approached, the man froze. He saw the police car. It looked like he saw a ghost. His, his face turned white and he physically started to tremble. The two cars next to the man with trunks filled with garbage bags caught the officer's attention. Upon searching, he made a shocking discovery. They contained bloody tools and blood-soaked clothes, and the rest had a dismembered body cut into 66 pieces in the most gruesome manner possible. The man disposing of the bags identified himself as 40-year-old Vladimir Zelenin. The police finally found out who the person inside the bags was. He put his head down, started rocking back and forth, and started to cry and said, it's over, I'm finished. He then said, it's Yakov Glusman. Yakov Glusman, 48, a famous cancer researcher and billionaire, unfortunately fell victim to Vladimir's twisted actions. When, when he was asked, uh, uh, why did you chop him up into 67 pieces? He said, Yakov, big man, too big to get out the door in one piece. Then the case took the most unexpected turn when he mentioned the name Rita Glusman, who was Yakov's wife. Now the big question was, how was Rita connected to this tragic event? Did she plot to kill her husband, or was Vladimir merely playing a blame game to divert attention and escape the consequences? But to understand this situation fully, we need to rewind and meet the man at the center of it all. Yakov Klusman, who was he, and what role did he play in this tragic event? Yakov Klusman was born on January 2, 1948. He was a scientist who was globally recognized for his contributions to cancer research. Yakov and his wife Rita had known each other since childhood in Ukraine, then part of the Soviet Union. Rita Glutzman was born in Trevnisti, Ukraine in 1948. She was the eldest daughter of Paula and Leib Shapiro, who were both Holocaust survivors. Growing up, Rita developed a unique perspective when she witnessed the death of close family and friends at the hands of the Nazis. However, Yakov's value as a researcher made it impossible for him to secure a visa to leave. He was considered a up-and-coming, brilliant scientist. After leaving for Israel in February 1970, Rita discovered she was pregnant with their son. Meanwhile, Yakov sacrificed his academic career in the Soviet Union by taking a simple job as a carpenter to make it easier for them to emigrate. With help from Jewish groups, Rita pushed the United Nations to reunite her with Yakov in America. She also went on an 18-day hunger strike near the UN and pressured the U.S. Senate to help reunite her with Yakov. Rita is clearly a very driven person to go on a hunger strike. She wants to make something of herself. Her efforts forced the Soviet Union to let Yakov join her in the West. The couple then finally reunited in the U.S. in 1972, and Yakov was able to continue his scientific work. Then, five years later in 1977, they settled in Long Island, New York, by 1987, Yakov started Harbor Laboratory, a pharmaceutical company in New York. At the same time, Rita had also established her technology company, ECI Technologies, with Yakov's help. Yakov progressed to become the director of molecular biology in 1987 for Ladeerly Laboratories in Rockland County. While managing ECI Technologies, Rita had to take the tough decision of relocating to Long Island as Yakov worked in Rockland. But as time went on, the family became more successful and moved into a spacious residence in the rich area of Upper Saddle River, New Jersey. A very nice uh, upper middle class uh, community. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful neighborhood. Homes on three quarters to an acre of land. Uh, very comfortable. If Rita and Yakov truly had a happy marriage, then Zelenin's claims don't add up. Could he be fabricating this entire story to hide a more sinister motive, like eliminating Yakov for financial gain? Before we jump to conclusions, to get a full picture, let's rewind to the time when Yakov's body was found. On Easter, April 7, 1996, Officer Freeman made an unusual discovery at the river's edge in a parking lot. The first thing he saw was two cars with open trunks. He also noticed Vladimir Zelenin, who wore a t-shirt and a single glove on his right hand. Zelenin was tossing large black trash bags into the river. 
Approaching cautiously, Freeman noticed blood splatters on Zelenin's pants and shoes, with the surgical glove covered in blood. The smell of drying blood hung in the air. While investigating further, Freeman found a bag with bloody tools, a hacksaw, axes, knives, and a scalpel, and another bag with blood-soaked clothes. Shockingly, the trunks of the two cars revealed eight more bags, and they contained the tragically dismembered remains of Yakov Gluzman. His body was cut into 66 pieces, a gruesome act that even involved removing his nose and lips. Officer Freeman stood with Vladimir Zelenin with bloodstained pants. He was Russian and could barely communicate in English. Shockingly, he revealed that Rita Glutzman was Vladimir's cousin and that she played a crucial role in helping him immigrate to the United States just 11 months prior. He came from a rough background in Russia. She got him a job and she got him a nice apartment and he was making a life for his, uh, his two children and he was totally dependent on her. The chilling revelation unfolded as Vladimir confessed that it was actually Rita who forced him into the unthinkable act of taking Yakov's life. The following day, when authorities in Bergen County arrived at Rita's home, she had already left along with her passport. This raised concerns among prosecutors that she might have fled overseas. However, as Zelenin was detained in Bergen County, Rita was supposedly heading for Long Island. It was evident that she was aware that the authorities would be searching for her. During her journey, she briefly stopped in Ville, stealing a set of New York license plates from a parked car to make her vehicle less conspicuous with its New Jersey tags. Even though investigators in both jurisdictions had not officially declared Rita as a suspect in her husband's death, there was little doubt that she had orchestrated the killing and now was running away from the police. A public alert was issued, emphasizing their intention to speak with her. Rita stayed out of sight for six days following her husband's death. Eventually, the police found her in Cold Spring Harbor, Long Island, on April 12, 1996. The discovery took place during a routine cleaning round at the Hawk's Nest cabin, when a cleaning lady spotted Rita breaking into a guest cabin. This cabin was owned by a former company where her husband had worked. The woman had mistaken Rita for a thief and promptly alerted the police about the situation. Upon being confronted, Rita tried to escape by scrambling out of a back window onto the laboratory grounds. But after a while, local police managed to find her and placed her under arrest. Notably, her car had a stolen license plate, and inside the vehicle, authorities found various travel brochures, including some from Switzerland and Australia. Additionally, Rita was carrying a passport and flight information for trips to Switzerland. The police were shocked to see Rita Glusman after her arrest. She was not the woman who walked in luxurious clothes anymore. She had changed the hair color that she normally had clothes, she had makeup, she had uh, airline information. She had changed her look entirely, which led to the police getting more suspicious. But there was one problem which didn't let the police charge her for the murder of her husband. Under New York law, uh, if you have an accomplice testifying against a defendant, you have to corroborate the accomplice's testimony. It's not enough just to have the accomplice say that the defendant did it. But the investigation took a turn when cracks began to appear in the seemingly perfect facade of their marriage. During their move from Long Island to New Jersey, hidden tensions emerged between the couple. Despite being a mutual decision, it became apparent that relocating to New Jersey caused financial stress for Rita, especially for her company ECI Technology. The business it was not going as well as it used to, and it depended a lot on Yakov Glusman's income to keep afloat. But there was one inconsistency. Rita had claimed that the move left them poverty stricken, but she was seen wearing mink coats, driving a BMW, and living a pretty luxurious life. In contrast, Yakov Klusman used to drive a 1983 Nissan and dressed in normal jeans. His friends described him more of as kind of a, an everyday type guy, a guy who walked around in khakis. She was into the, the American dream. She wanted the, the spas and the high living. In the summer of 1995, Yakov Klusman moved out of the New Jersey house and rented a second floor apartment in Pearl River, a few blocks from work. By September of that year, Yakov Klusman had started a romantic relationship with a woman he had previously met while visiting his family in Israel. In 1994, the relationship between Yakov and Rita had irreparably deteriorated. Yakov was advancing his career as a cancer researcher, while Rita's technology company was facing financial ruin. By the fall of 1994, during a telephone conversation with his father, 
Yakov had admitted that his 25-year marriage to Rita was falling apart. Shortly after, in December 1995, Yakov Glusman filed for divorce. One of the contentions uh, was control of ECI technologies. Dr. Glusman did not want to relinquish control. Rita Glusman wanted complete and unauditable control of ECI. Despite his generous divorce offer, Rita declined it. During their divorce proceedings, the ECI technology company became a focal point. Rita wanted sole ownership of the company, while Yakov insisted on properly reviewing its financials before he agreed to any terms. Hearing this, Rita was devastated. When Yakov initiated the divorce, he cited marital cruelty as the reason. Four months later in 1996, tragedy struck as the couple's 25-year-old son lost his life while serving in the Israeli army, which added more strain to their already fragile relationship. She was so incensed that he would want to walk away from her. She was so invested in, in what he had become in the United States that how dare he think that he could leave her. Rita found herself growing desperate, and some observed her behavior becoming erratic. Despite receiving $90,000 from Yakov when he moved out a year earlier in 1995, she struggled to curb her desires for luxury. All of a sudden, she was in America where she could consume as much as she wanted. It was a symbol of success to her. In an attempt to halt the divorce, Rita Glusman hired a private investigator to find any damaging information against Yakov. She resorted to illegal actions like wiretapping Yakov's phone and even threatened to poison his girlfriend with the AIDS virus. One of the things that she wanted to do was to also discredit this woman in, in Israel uh, by planting cocaine on her. She had hired or tried to hire numerous people. She had people following her husband. She had people trying to extort her husband's family. When these schemes failed to prevent the divorce, Rita Glusman began plotting to take his life. She faced another setback when she got caught stealing small items from a pharmacy in New Jersey, which led to her arrest on shoplifting charges. Yakov offered uh, the bulk of their estate, which was valued at the time at a million and a half dollars, to, to Rita to let him walk. Her business continued to decline, and the divorce proceedings became more bitter as both sides exchanged accusations. Rita had already made a firm decision and was ready to involve her cousin Zelenin. Her plan, though simple, was incredibly brutal. In the months leading up to Easter, Rita obtained a key to her ex-husband's apartment. She convinced him to give it to her during one of their arguments and had it duplicated. Knowing her ex-husband's routine, she was aware that he often spent Saturday evenings at the lab and usually returned home around 11.30 p.m. Being aware that Rita ensured they had all the tools they would need, a hacksaw, a scalpel, a knife, along with numerous cleaning products. On the night of April 6, 1996, just hours before Yakov was supposed to return home, Rita and Zelenin drove from Bergen County and a late model Ford Taurus registered to her company. They parked in a dimly lit area not very far from Yakov's apartment, and silently waited in the living room. At 11.30 p.m., Yakov pulled his Nissan Maxima into his parking spot and entered his apartment. That's when Zelenin delivered the initial blow with an axe. She and Vladimir lay in wait in Yakov's apartment and sprung on him, att attacked him as he walked in the door with an axe and a hatchet. He said that Rita Glusman then came over and began hitting her husband with the axe. And at that point, uh, Zelenin received his injury on his hand. In the darkness, he couldn't precisely see where he hit Yakov, but the scientist collapsed to the floor. Rita, filled with rage and vicious force, then attacked her husband. At one point, her axe slipped, striking Zelenin on the right hand, which caused continuous bleeding. Rita insisted they had no time to spare and would look into Zelenin's wound later. Grabbing a knife from the bag, she plunged into her ex-husband's chest to ensure he was not alive. They dragged his bloody corpse into the bathroom, proceeding to dismember the body. Rita insisted on making sure no piece of the man was large enough to be identified. They cut off his fingertips to prevent fingerprint identification and even removed his nose and lips to make sure anybody who might discover the body could never recognize him. While Zelenin continued butchering the body, Rita went on a cleaning frenzy, attempting to remove any evidence of the crime. Only one neighbor, Kathy Armstrong, residing a floor below Yakov, heard something thumping and banging around 3 a.m. on April 7, 1996. Little did she know, they were disposing of what remained of Yakov, 
his body parts and bloody clothing stuffed into nine plastic garbage bags. The tools used for the gruesome task were crammed into another bag. Subsequently, the bags were loaded into the trunks of the two cars. Zelina would then return to East Rutherford, dispose of Gluzman's remains in the Passaic River, and then get rid of the car before sunrise. However, a hitch occurred. They were off schedule. While loading one of the cars, Zelina accidentally triggered its theft alarm. It was just a brief wail in the night, and if anyone in the apartment complex heard the alarm, they didn't bother to investigate. Despite this, Rita panicked, jumped into the Taurus, and instructed Zelina to speed away. They circled the neighborhood for some time before cautiously returning to the apartment complex, making sure the coast was clear and resuming their somber task. Moreover, dismembering Yakov and cleaning his apartment took longer than Rita had anticipated. The schedule was further disrupted by the need to address the wound on Zelina's hand, a consequence of Rita's violent actions against her husband. While traveling south, Zelina and Rita made a stop at CVS Pharmacy in the town of Fairlawn. Rita purchased $32 worth of bandage, and this was recorded by a surveillance camera. After investigators examined the crime scene at Yakov Gluzman's Pearl River apartment, it became clear that what initially appeared as a straightforward murder case was anything but that. While the investigators discovered some weird traces of forensic evidence, they had not yet undergone testing. The uncertainty remained even after testing, as there was no guarantee that the evidence would straight out point to Rita as the culprit. Even if they managed to find a stray fingerprint belonging to Rita, the police were aware that a skilled defense attorney could dismiss it, connecting it to one of the couple's periodic arguments. They had a lot of evidence that Vladimir Zelenin was there and, and had murdered this man but they really had very little direct physical evidence that Rita was even there. And they were worried that they were not going to be able to get a murder conviction. At this stage, the police lacked concrete evidence and relied solely on Zelenin's confession. However, this posed a challenge as New York state law dictated that a murder case couldn't rest on the testimony of an accomplice unless supported by additional witnesses or compelling evidence, which was currently absent. The day after Rita's arrest, her attorney, Michael Rosen, tried to secure bail, citing the unusual nature of the case. Even though there was the possibility of murder charges, the judge rejected bail, and this prompted Rosen to file a felony examination. Prosecutors had 48 hours to prove Rita was dangerous, and there was a risk of her fleeing again for her to be held without bail. Rosen succeeded, as the police were unable to provide sufficient evidence and Rita left for jail after paying $250,000 bond. But then, a call from an FBI agent changed everything. In a surprising turn, Rosen was directed to bring Rita to the U.S. Federal Court building in White Plains. This was unexpected, and Rosen was confused about why the federal government was getting involved. As Rosen and Rita arrived, the reason became clear. While Michael Rosen had been focused on securing bail for Rita, Local authorities had collaborated with federal prosecutors and planned a unique approach to charge her for her involvement in her husband's death. In a concise four-page complaint, federal prosecutors used the 1994 Domestic Violence Statute, officially named the Violence Against Women Act. It was a bold move. This law allowed federal intervention when someone crosses state lines to commit domestic violence, a tactic never against a woman until now. You have to just cross a state line to injure your spouse. So looking at the statute, it fit perfectly this case where they went from the state of New Jersey into the state of New York, specifically to commit a crime against a spouse, and that resulted in his death. However, it provided the authorities with the leverage needed to prosecute Rita. Notably, it granted them the freedom to use Zelenin's testimony. It was a look that could almost pierce you, go through your body. She had the ability to, to look right at you and almost through you at the same time. Later, Zelina explained in court how the whole incident took place and how they dismembered Yakov. Vladimir Zelenin said that he was hiding behind the door as it opened and that Rita Glusman was a few feet away uh, behind, uh, behind a wall. As soon as Yakov walked through the door, he uh, gave him the first blow with an axe to the back of the head. And Rita had a, a knife hacking and stabbing Mr. Glusman to the point that she almost severed Selenin's fingers off his right hand. He said he started by uh, cutting off the left leg 
below the knee, and then the right leg below the knee, uh, cut off the arm at the shoulder. He said he then uh, cut off his head. The police brought in additional evidence, including eyewitness accounts from Yakov's neighbors, who spotted a couple loading bags into a car at 3 a.m. on April 7, 1996. A drugstore clerk identified Rita as the distressed woman purchasing bandages and antiseptic at 4 a.m. on the same morning. Furthermore, a private investigator, hired by Rita to spy on her husband and his lover, confessed to her controlling nature. She had hired or tried to hire numerous people. She had people following her husband. She had people trying to extort her husband's family. On April 30th, 1997, over a year and a half after Yakov's death, Rita faced the U.S. District Court Judge Barrington Parker. She insisted that she didn't kill her husband. But the jury, convinced by Zelenin's words, found her guilty of murdering Yakov, chopping him into pieces, and planning to dump him in the river. He turned to Rita Glisman and said, F*** you, bitch. And I guess that was his way of saying, you got me into this mess, now it's on you. The judge sentenced her to spend the rest of her life in prison. The woman, once hailed as a symbol of freedom for an entire class in the Soviet Union, now found herself incarcerated behind bars. Later, in May 1997, Vladimir was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. In 2020, Rita Glusman was released from prison on compassionate grounds due to her declining health, which included multiple strokes and early Parkinson's disease. Rita's plea for a second chance to avoid dying in prison was considered by the judge, although Yakov's brother expressed horror and fear in a letter opposing her release. Despite concerns, the judge permitted her release, and Rita returned home. Yakov Glusman's life took a terrible turn because of a broken marriage. The sad part is it was because of his wife, who was once seen as a symbol of freedom. Instead of finding a peaceful solution, their relationship turned into a nightmare. We hope you gained insights from this video. Share your thoughts in the comments. Tell us which case you'd like us to explore next. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to Mysterious Hook. Until next time, stay curious.